Hello, WCA. Michael Mori here. Week 8 update, fall 2018. Thanks very much for coming in. It was a great term. Uh, what I like most about it is seeing you out at tournaments and then seeing you lose games. That's right. I said it. I like to see you lose. The reason, well, I don't have to repeat it. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. You're going to hit walls. You're going to have trouble. You're going to be totally winning and then lose the game in one move. And the opposite's going to happen. You're going to be totally lost, but you're going to hang in there. And next thing you know, your opponent might make a mistake and you're back in the game. It's all about commitment. Keep playing chess because it's good for your character. It teaches you how to lose. It teaches you how to face adversity, all that good stuff. Okay, And it's not coming from teachers and parents. It's coming from you. You're the only ones experiencing this stuff. Okay, So let's take a look at a game uh, that's going to turn into another game. What does that mean? This is a position between Fody and James R. that was played last Sunday. It's a really good game. As a matter of fact, if I told you it was a Grandmaster game, you couldn't tell the difference. Because um, look at the Kings. Everybody's castled. Uh, it's almost symmetrical, but there, there are some small differences here. You'll see the, the placement of the two bishops on this side of the board. Um, but what happened here is, as I was going over this game, I realized um, in my database, I found a game that was played uh, by two really strong players. And I want to share with you something that could have happened in Fody's game and James. So let me show you their game continuation. It's white to play, and here Fody makes a trade on c6 he gives up the bishop for the knight and rather than taking back right away on c6 james decides to get a little tactical and play this in-between move of bishop takes knight um this trade kind of helps white a little bit because it brings the queen into the game and when you take the piece back here on c6 just do a little math you see that you have two minor pieces in the game for black, but white now really has three pieces in the game because the queen replaced the knight. Uh, white is certainly not winning, but it's just a little bit better for white. If you go back before the trade, if you come back to this position, you see that white has one, two, three, four pieces in the game. So does black. When the trades take place, this little in-between move gives a chance for white to get that extra piece into the game. Is it winning? Absolutely not. But what Fody decided to do is go for another trade here. By taking on f6, James decides to take back with the queen. He then finishes the trades. And here, it looks like Fody kind of went against what I just said. Like, you have an extra piece in the game. Why be in such a rush to trade? And that might be true. Um, but it turns out this exact position was in my database. Um, Fody went on to play a little bit differently from here. But I want to just share with you guys um, what happened in this master game. Because... If a master is willing to make all these trades, we really need to ask why. And congratulations to Fody, by the way. He won his section. I think he went 4-0 in the last tournament. Uh, and his notation, I'm going to put it in a museum. Absolutely perfect. Okay, let me show you something here. Whoops, that's it. The master playing the white pieces went for this trade for a very, very simple reason. He wants to take advantage of the f5 square. What is that square? It's an outpost square. Yes, I'm going to repeat what an outpost... Luca, I know you know. I'm repeating it anyway. An outpost square is a square on your opponent's side of the board. See that? It's protected by a friendly pawn, and there are no enemy pawns that can chase whatever you have here away. So, for example, if white could, you know, magically put a rook on that square, you can't get rid of this rook unless you trade it for the other rook. But that's not really white's plan. Oh, sorry, that's not white's plan either. What piece do you think white would like to get to that outpost square? What do you think? Stop the video. Okay, did you guys figure it out? It's the king. No, it's not the king. It's not. It's who? The knight. So in this position, white moved the knight. 
where and why. 92. You see the path the knight is going to take? Now, black is not going to resign here. Black played king h8. Why? So cool when you go over master games. Why, why, why? Why would black put the king in the corner? Simple. He wants to put the rook on g8 and get some play on the g file. White wants to get the knight to f5. And this is something we always repeat to our students. If you have a plan and your plan cannot be stopped by your opponent, look at black's last move. It was king h8. You know the reason, but what was white's plan? They put the knight on e2 because it wants to come to g3 and into f5, correct? All right. Did king h8 stop that plan? If the answer is no, play your move, okay? Knight goes to g3. Now, black is pretty much going to say the same thing. You can't stop white from jumping in there, but what was black's plan? It was rook to g8. So they're going to keep following their plans until, you know, you, you make a threat and I have to deal with your threat. The other time that you don't follow through with your plan is if you're in time pressure. Knight hops into f5. Oops. If it gets there, if it gets here to e7, it's going to be a fork. It's going to hit the rook and it's going to hit the pawn here. So black decided to play rook a to e8. And this gives white a little bit of an advantage because in this position, you know, the rook is kind of worried about the knight and, and rooks don't want to do that. Rooks would rather come to files and, you know, put some more pressure on the opponent. So then white came up with this nice little plan, pawn to c3. The idea will be revealed in a moment. Black pushed in the middle. So here, you know, what black is trying to do, if, if you take the pawn, they're going to undouble their pawns. And if this e-pawn disappears, then this knight is not on technically on an outpost square yet because it's not protected by a pawn. You guys see that little idea? If, if black gets this pawn to take, it doesn't mean that this g-pawn can't come here someday to protect the pawn, but you can't do that right now with the rook on this line. So if you take the pawn, black is going to take back, and if that happens, you undouble black c-pawns, and at the same time, you loosen up your knight a little bit. Aha. So white played rook here. And the idea was, in case black took, and they did, maybe, maybe black shouldn't have done that, but black decided to take here, and... After making this trade, the idea was to fight the rooks on the file. The only problem with this plan was there's a little bit of a weakness here with these pawns. You see how they all got shattered? And you're going to see how white takes advantage of that later. So maybe back here, maybe black could have come in and put a little pressure on this pawn. You see that you can't protect the pawn with your, uh, with your pawn because it's pinned. So you may have to move your rook to e1. At least that takes a little pressure off the d-file. So here, white is still better, but at least black putting some pressure on the pawn, you know, makes it a little tougher. So back here, when you play rook to d8, white found a really cool idea, knight h6, which hits the rook on g8 and threatens a really nasty check on uh, f7. So to deal with that, we make an exchange of rooks. Rook takes, rook takes, but it's, it leaves black with a problem now because you have a pawn on f7 hanging and white has taken control of the, uh, the only full open file on the board. So white is clearly better here. So the rook went into defensive mode, protected the pawn, and here white goes into tactical mode. You know, if you put the rook on the seventh rank, this is really, really, really strong for white. You're dominating not only the file, but now you're dominating the rank. You're probably going to win this pawn at some point um, or just keep an enormous amount of pressure. But here, white decided to play tactically and just gives away a whole rook. Uh, you see what black is up to? What, what uh, White, rather, what white really wants to get is a position where this knight can play against this bishop. Because if this knight can hop between these squares, there's no way that this bishop can stop that. You can eventually walk your king in his white. 
Um, so that's pretty much White's idea here. Black decides to make the trade. When they make the trade here, you have to see that little fork that you have, which wins a pawn. Because you get the f7 pawn, the king moves, and you pick up your rook, uh, which you gave away a second ago. All that is is a tactic. Look at it again. Just rook to d8. It's really not a difficult tactic to see once you learn the basics of a fork, right? So rook takes, you get a nice little fork, king moves, and you take. But what I really like is how uh, the game continues from here because there's a threat. You see those two arrows that I pointed here, one to the bishop, one to the king? There's a knight fork on e6. So uh, that combined with this pawn hanging here, black is in trouble. So the bishop gets out of the way, so at least it's not a fork. Knight takes on c6, and now the king comes over to try to, you know, get involved. And you have to be careful as white because you're in enemy territory. And this bishop on b6 controls a lot of squares on white side. So sometimes the knights hop in, but they don't always get out. But here, white has plenty of escape squares. But be careful with that, my friends. You jump your knight into enemy territory, make sure it can get out. Pawn a4. Very nice idea. Trying to trap that bishop up on b6. King comes to e6. Pawn a5 hitting the bishop. Bishop comes to c5. And then b4 hitting the bishop. Really nice sequence of moves now. King d7. White is faced with the possibility of trading pawn for bishop right here. King takes knight. But if that happens, it's going to look something like this. If you take right away and the king takes, white is still winning here. But there are some ideas that white has to know in order to win this. But if you first glance at this position, you may not see those winning ideas and think that black is actually better here. Why? Because the black king is so active and these pawns over here for white are in really bad shape. They're double isolated, this is isolated. Black is gonna win some pawns and you may make a passed pawn. In order for white to win this move, they're gonna to have to be familiar with how to make a breakthrough up here. But if you go back, you do not have to take this bishop. So what did white do? They played a beautiful in-between move, knight to b8 check, putting the knight like where the other knight started, a black knight started up here, correct? Now you have a white knight up there. But the idea is, hey, your bishop is hanging. So if you don't want to lose a piece for nothing, you're going to have to come after my knight up here, which black did. Now you take the bishop, and the difference is once they take the knight, look where the black king is. For him to get to these pawns is going to take more time, but a very cool idea pawn a6. You see the idea? You're not going to let the king come through this door. So the king decides to come through another door. Well, <laughs> not this one. The king comes to d8, c4, e7, and now c5. You see all those pawn moves? Why were they played? Do you see why? You cannot get into these squares. Why this square is highlighted right now? I have no idea. But these three, you cannot come into these squares. I think I meant to highlight that square. Yeah, I just fixed it. You see that? The black king cannot use any of those squares. Tough to get in. So what to do after c5? Well, let's break the pawn structure. The only problem here is white can take this pawn. Because when you attack it, you protect it. And this creates a situation, and I'll explain these highlights, this is a protected passed pawn. This pawn here protects it. If the king ever takes the back pawn, the front one is going to run. So black tries to break that. White says, I'll just protect it. They make a trade of pawns. And here in this position, black resigned. Why? All you have to do is walk your king up attack this pawn, and eventually this king is going to move away, and you're up like 600 pawns, okay? So, Fody and James, thank you for starting a game and getting into a middle game that led me to a position that 
a master played with the white pieces. So that's how it works. You keep looking at games, playing, and you know what else. All right. I have to go. Thank you again. I look forward to seeing you all in January. Keep studying, studying, play, play.